my trials, Lord, walk with me. Each sermon that I share with you is some weeks in the making. So with this one, this one about the uncertainty of not knowing what will happen in our futures and the courage that God gives us to live into that uncertainty. Part and parcel of this theme is, of course, the question, is God in control? It's everything that happens part of God's plan. That is to say, God's will. It's a big question. It's a difficult question. And then, just in regular life, you know, leading, working on this sermon, leading up to today, the question became more urgent and pressing for me. My dear friend Bill Chadwick, pastor at Oak Grove Presbyterian Church, who many of you know, he's preached here twice within the last few months, called me in tears, asking for prayers. His brother-in-law and sister-in-law, that is, his wife Chris's sister, Jeannie, and Jeannie's husband, Bob, had been with two other couples at a veterinarian conference in the Czech Republic and had been in a terrible accident. <coughs> Bob, Bob and two of the women had been killed. Jeannie, Chris's sister, was clinging to life. And by the way, um, she is in critical condition still, but um, the good news is that um, that there's a good chance that there is no life-threatening injuries, multiple massive trauma, multiple broken bones, and that we expect and hope that she will live. Prior to this happening, before that happened, but while I was working on this sermon, I decided to post on my Facebook page a summary of what I wanted to say to my children and others in the climate change work and others who care about poor people who need health insurance. I wanted to say something on the Facebook, a word of hope, that God holds the future in her hands and all will be well. A colleague of mine posted a response that basically said, this is highly condensed, well, what about the Holocaust? Wars, famines, all of the innocents who died, all will be well. I wrote him back an, an email, not on Facebook, because I hate those debates that have been on Facebook, and I didn't want to do that. And I shared part of what I said in my email back to him because I have no right to speak to you of faith in God's providence unless I have had my faith tested. The preacher cannot speak and expect anyone to listen on this subject unless it is clear that the preacher has asked these devastating questions in her own life. My hope for today then would be that you, the listener, might lead with at least this thought. I do not know if I believe that God is in control of the future because of what I've been through in my own life. But this person who preached today has also been through a lot. And for whatever it's worth, he does believe that. Here is part of my email. The claim, Terry, that I am making is that nothing, no thing, or person is ever lost. In my life, I've had a 16-year-old niece killed in a car wreck, a 24-year-old niece die of cystic fibrosis. My wife battles three cancers. I've been a student in seminary of the Holocaust. I have stumbled around in a daze in a ravaged Haiti. The claim being made is not that we don't suffer and that the innocents don't die and suffer. The claim is that even for the worst of it, there is a force that will make the best of it. That not one of the Holocaust victims 
has been lost. I have seen a convergence of science and faith in my life. Both quantum physics and Holy Scripture say that we all came from the same place, we're made of the same stuff, and we will end up together in the same place. The divine makes of our very ashes the forms and shapes of the new life. I believe in resurrection. So again I say, have no fear. Love will triumph. It's going to turn out all right. And no matter the situation we find ourselves in, we may labor on in full confidence that in the very futures we are terrified of, God is already there waiting for us. The scripture for this morning is um, a very famous Old Testament scripture from the book of Exodus. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me to hell. Yet you have said, said, I know you by name, Moses, and you have also found favor in my sight. God went on, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said, if your presence will not go, do not carry us away then. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight unless you go with us? The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. And God said, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name Yahweh. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I show mercy. But, God said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And God continued, see there a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. And I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back. But my face you will not see. Let us pray. Holy One, be with your servants now and your servant. That the words that shine light on this, our existence here. We pray in your holy name. If only I could know how it's all going to turn out. Oh, if only I could know how it's going to all turn out. How many times in our lives, standing at some great precipice, some not-to-be-repeated moment, some painful, trying time, some grief, some foundation-rattling decision, have we uttered or prayed these words? If I could only know how it's going to all turn out. If I could only know how this surgery is going to go. If I could only know what grade I'm going to make on my chemistry test. If I could only know if I should take this job or not. If I could only know whether my Medicaid is going to be taken away from me. If I could only know if this pain and sadness will ever subside. These are important questions because, and here is the premise of the sermon, if we could know the future, the present becomes so much more liberal and the past comprehensible. The pain, the anxiety, the stress we have now becomes palpable and durable and in some cases even useful 
if we could only know that it turns out all right. I remember a friend of mine telling me about her journey to finding a partner. She told me about all of the pain and agony she had gone through in the dating process. Blind dates whom she had no more in common with than a lamp pole. <laughs> Others who took her acceptance to go to dinner as an acceptance to do anything else he might have had in mind. Several who she was really interested in, but never called her back. I think she said what really made it so awful was not knowing if it was all going to turn out all right. If I could only have known about Gary, you know, I think I would have enjoyed the whole thing a lot more. Don't we all want this? I mean, we may laugh out loud at Sister Lucille's fortune telling parlor down the street. Oh, 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 can you imagine that? When in fact, yes, we can imagine that. For we wish that she or somebody could tell us how it's going to all turn out. This is exactly what Moses was doing. Poor Moses. Wow. You all have heard the story out in the wilderness with all of these rank, nasty people just wandering around and fussing and complaining and not knowing where they were going and having to complain about everything Moses did. He just had had it and goes off to talk with God up the mountain and the people, when he would do that, they'd fall apart even more and start partying and fussing and making golden calves. You know that story. Until Moses would come back down and they'd be real sorry. We're real sorry, Moses. <clears throat> you get the feeling that just as soon as Moses was not around, they'd go right back at him. And poor Moses. He's got to go and try to explain this, to explain this bunch of people, this bunch of nincompoops to the Almighty God. He's just caught in the middle. And he's just about had enough. So he decides to make a direct appeal to God. There's just too much uncertainty. He doesn't know where this is all going. And so he decides to ask God for help. And he plans out how to make his appeal. He'll make the first appeal. And he knows that God will not be convinced. So he prepares a counterattack to use after God says no the first time. So he says, God, you told me to do this. You called me to do this, to lead your people, but they're just a bunch of numbskulls, and I'm struggling, and you said I found favor in your eyes, and if that's true, I really want to ask you to come with me. Lead the way. Go with us, please. Have any of you ever asked a favor and were expecting a no so much that you didn't hear the yes? <laughs> I was in high school about 17 years old, a couple of years driving behind in my resume, and I decided that I wanted to take the family Ford LTD. And for you folks that are too, that are too young to know, that was the the car of that era. It was a Ford LTD, and I wanted to drive my best friend Paul and I to, from Orlando to South Carolina for a week of bass fishing. Had my argument all worked out in two parts. One for the initial request, and then after the rebuttal, after my father said no, the other. Dad, you know what a trustworthy person I am. I go to church every Sunday. I'm in the youth group. I sing in the youth choir. Heck, I may even be a preacher someday. I'm a good driver. And Paul, you know what a responsible person he is. And Uncle Fennel's cabin there on the lake, you know how safe it is. Dad, please, please can we go? And Dad said, Okay, son, you can go. And I said, why not, Dad? <laughs> and I went off on my second argument. God says, yes, Moses, I will go with you. And Moses says, why not, God? If you will not go with us, and there he goes off and says, patiently God comes back. Moses, listen, the very thing that you have spoken, that I will do, for I know your name, and you have found favor in my and then something really, really big dawns on Moses. God is answering questions. Whoa. We may have here the first ever divine press conference. <laughs> Moses has asked a question and God has answered. It's, it's like all of us sisters and brothers to Moses come up behind him and whisper in Moses' ear, Moses, you've got God talking. 
Keep him talking. We've got all these questions, Moses, asking, why is there pain? Why do good people get killed in a car wreck? Why do good people get sick and die too soon? Why are there starving people? Why depression that cripples us? Why, our dear planet, so sick? We know you don't cause all these things, God. You love us too much. You, you give your very life to be with us. You are with us. And all that happens, we know you don't cause these things. But you're the creator. You're the one who made the universe, God. You were the one who has given this freedom. The freedom wasn't our idea. If you'd asked us, we'd have probably said freedom. You mean real freedom? Let, let, let's talk about halfway freedom. Like, you know, God, freedom made some minor decisions. Just as long as nothing bad had happened. You know, freedom when we get in the car to drive, decide where we're going to go. You know, stuff like that. But, but real freedom? Freedom to run a stop sign? No oh, thanks, God. Uh -uh. No, you, when we get ready to make a mistake, you take over. Just make everything warm and cozy and loving. But you didn't ask us that. You are the creator. So why, God? Why is it this way? And Moses, wanting to know all these things himself, does ask God. He says, I pray thee, God, show me thy glory. And the Hebrew carries with it the meaning, tell me everything. And into the battery of microphones and the flash of our iPhone cameras popping, God answers, oh, my beloved children, I cannot tell you. I cannot show you my glory. I cannot tell you my knowledge. It's too great. It's too vast. It would overwhelm you. If you were to see what I see, if you were to know what I know, you could not speak. You could not breathe. You could not live. It is too wonderful. It is too awful. It is not for you to know. But there is something you can know. I am real. I exist, I love you, and I am going out before you, ahead of you, to any place that you might in your life find yourself in, wonderful or awful. Friends, here's what I think that means. I speak to you from the experience of my own life, this is part of my testimony to you. God goes out ahead of us not to prevent every bad thing that can happen. I do not know why it is that way. And to be honest with you, no one knows why. There are billions of books that have been written on it. Anyone who tries to tell you that they know why is blowing smoke. All the way from the one who says, in the face of the car accident and the death of a beloved father and husband, God needed another baritone in the heavenly choir. From someone like that all the way to someone like me, who says, <coughs> it's the best I know how to say. It's all I know how to say. That the freedom of creation that we have been made in the image of God is so precious is so crucial to our growing and being in that image of God that we have the freedom to miss the stop sign. No one knows why it's this way. I do know that it is this way. There is freedom, blessed freedom, yes? And cursed. But I also know and I also testify to the truth that in that future, God goes with us, out ahead of us, to be wherever we find ourselves in the future. And because of that, through any dangers, toils, and snares, it is going to turn out 
all right. I close with this. Luann was a high school student in one of the first churches I served. We have kept in contact up until about 10 years ago. She had become at that point a physical therapist. Boy, not my word, other word for them is angels. And was a wife and mother. We kept in contact for all those years because of a contract that she and I made with each other. We made the contract when she was 15, two nights after I and her parents had held her hand in the emergency room while they emptied her stomach of whatever she had taken in an attempt to end her life. So we made this contract to check in with each other. And she had made it. It wasn't always easy, she told me over the phone. There were struggles, there was hard times, but friends helped. She had wonderful, gifted therapists. Her church was important. God had been present. At the end of one lively, laughing, animated conversation on the phone, I said, oh, Luann, what a future you have. I am so glad you are still here, that it can be yours. And she said, when, if I could have known that even with all of the pain that I would suffer in my life, how much love and joy there is, I would never have tried to take my life. Any who can hear these words, you who suffer, who grieve, who are lonely, who are despairing, you want to know how it's going to all turn out. Here is how in the words to my one of my favorite hymns. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future <coughs> as the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend through thorny ways leads to a joy.